It's now my pleasure to introduce our second keynote speaker, Mr. John Robert Smith. John Robert Smith is currently president and CEO of Reconnecting America, a national nonprofit that advises civic and community leaders on how to overcome community development challenges to create better communities for all. He is also a former mayor of Meridian, Mississippi, and a longtime leader on behalf of Passenger Rail. He is co-chairman of Transportation for America, a former chairman of Amtrak's board, and a former member of the Transportation Committees of the National League of Cities and the U.S. Conference of Mayors, as well as former co-chair of the National Forum on the Future of Passenger Rail. He is a veteran of the station-centered community development movement and led the drive to renovate the city of Meridian's Union Station, a $7 million historical restoration project that created a new multimodal transportation center, dramatically increased the use of the station, raised property values and city tax receipts, and lowered crime in the station's neighborhoods. He served on Reconnecting America's board for five years and was a founding partner and board member of Reconnecting America's uh, predecessor organization, the Great American Station Foundation. Please, everyone, join me in welcoming Mr. John Robert Smith. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be with you and good to be back in Eugene. Uh, I was here about a year and a half ago. Um, I have ridden your MX. I've seen your plans. I've seen the development springing up from that investment. And, and I do believe in this case, Chris, BRT is leading right. to right. economic development and rebirth uh, because they're doing it right. And I hope that's the key point of my message this morning. Uh, Mayor, I want to thank you for the kind introduction. And it's always a pleasure to spend any time with Chris Leinberger, certainly uh, one of the great urban thinkers in this country. I've been privileged to uh, work with him in Washington. I also want to recognize the mother of another great urban thinker <laughs> who is with us this morning. Mrs. Patricia um, is with us. Uh, Mrs. Patricia is the mother of Shelley Patricia, who is my predecessor in the role that I now occupy, but she also was tapped by the president to stand up the Sustainable Communities Initiative at the federal level, which encompasses all of the things that uh, Chris and I will talk about this morning. And by your presence here, the things you either love or are certainly very interested in. Um, I left the home that my grandfather built in the 1880s and uh, where I've spent my entire life. My grandson, Ethan, is the fifth generation of my family to grow up in that home. And I left that home and moved to Washington a little over two years ago to become the president and CEO of Reconnecting America, which is a national not-for-profit that is really dedicated to how we build our neighborhoods, our cities, and our regions at the connection of transportation choices and affordable housing. You see our mission statement here in the most important words are transform and thriving. We're about, we're not about just another set of plans to sit on some mayor's shelf and never be implemented. We're about creating transportation choices you can actually ride to places you can actually afford to live today. I am also one of the managing partners of the Center for Transit Oriented Development that is the only national not-for-profit dedicated exclusively to the research best practices and implementation of good transit-oriented development. And good transit-oriented development is not the parking lot next to the transit stop or the train station. I'm also um, one of the managing partners and co-chairs of Transportation for America. I co-chair that with Jeff Anderson of Smart Growth America this is a coalition of over 500 partner organizations that have come together to see that the next transportation authorization bill, and I work with Chris on this in DC, that that bill is the most visionary transportation bill that we can help Congress craft. And believe me, that's quite a heavy lift today. Um, where are we federally? Well, there's a House bill 
um, that is a five-year bill at present funding levels. Something has to be done between now and March because the, not only does the authorization bill expire, the authorization of the gas taxes ex expire as well. So there's a, a time crunch. Uh, they will either pass a bill or they will pass yet another extension. And I think aviation industry went through 28 extensions before they ever authorized a bill. You see, city cover government cannot act that way. We have to pass a budget every year or the state will take over running the city. Um, unfortunately, in Washington, you can can avoid that uh, difficult choice. So there's a five-year bill in the House. Um, it's paid for by drilling revenues, which the um, Congressional Budget Office has just scored to be, I believe, $78 billion short of making ends meet to fund that bill. Um, and they also take money from federal pensions to help pay for that five-year bill. The worst part of the bill is it takes public transit out of the trust fund and makes it subject to annual appropriations. You cannot build for the future on an annual appropriation. You need dedicated, a dedicated source of revenue so that you can order equipment and build four, five, six years out and know you'll have the revenue to pay those bills. Um, if you wonder what it's like to live on an annual appropriation in transportation, ask anyone who has worked with Amtrak, where the national passenger rail system has been subject to budgets that start at zero coming out of some administrations and then have to work from there. The Senate bill is much better. It's a two-year bill. It is, again, at current funding levels, and it's paid for by the various things you see there on the screen. It was going to be passed, by, with no doubt, by the end of this week, but for two amendments that have been offered to the transportation bill. Now keep in mind we're talking transportation. The first amendment is uh, foreign aid to Egypt. The second amendment is about contraception. <laughs> now I'm not quite sure how that relates to transportation, but this unfortunately is, is the kind of debate that's occurring in Washington today. I think we'll get past both of those. Uh, I think they're really making statements. Um, both chambers were going to pass bills before President's Day, but the House has pulled their bill, um, so it won't take it up till after that holiday. And the key question is, can you conference a bill out of the two very disparate bills that will come out of the House and Senate? I, I believe there's a possibility. Those of you, I saw a couple of people come in with bike helmets. Um, your mayors know that transportation enhancement funds are what cities use to do station area renovation and improvement, transit stop uh, station improvements, um, handicapped accessibility issues, bike paths, jogging paths, complete street improvements, um, uh, crossings at intersection, all of those things. Well, in the Senate bill, as, as much improved as it is over the House bill, there is language that says the state DOT will have an opt-out provision and they can decide that all of those transportation enhancement funds instead of going to cities, they will keep and they can use to mow right-of-way with. Well, I think you know what most DOTs will do in the country. They'll keep that money and not send it or allow mayors and council members to compete for it. Um, if you like those things I mentioned and you want your mayor to have the opportunity to ask for and seek those funds and keep in mind the only way you as a citizen have to appeal to your DOT for the things you want is through your mayor and your council and to give the state carte blanche authority to say we will not hear of such and we're keeping the money I think um, cuts you off, disenfranchises you as a citizen from being able to appeal through your mayor and council. So mayors, others in the room, I urge you to call your senators and ask them to support Amendment 1549 in the Senate, the Cardin Cochran Amendment, which is a bipartisan amendment. Senator Cardin is a Democrat from Maryland, Senator Cochran, Republican from Mississippi. Chris, I don't know of another bipartisan amendment on the floor right now, so this is quite remarkable. Um, and Senator Inhofe from Oklahoma 
who actually offered this opt-out provision, this is his comment, well, if you really believe that the best government is that which is closest to its people, then you don't get any closer than the mayor in the city council. Um, let's look at the nation. We prepared this map. You see the interstate highway system in black. You see conventional passenger rail service in green, some extensions of passenger rail, a conventional service we think makes sense in yellow. And then you see the designated high-speed rail corridors in red. The major airports where those modes of transportation connect, you see in those circle areas, but you see this great void up through the middle of the country. Um, that's not really connecting us to a system. And remember, when we built the interstate highway system, it was a system throughout the country. It didn't come through Meridian, Mississippi because of the traffic jams in Meridian. It was built through Mississippi because it offered us that connectivity to the future and to commerce and we think that our nation ought to be thinking about a transportation vision that doesn't compete highways against rail, against bus, against air, but where they work together in unison. And it's not just a big metropolitan issue. These are the micropolitan areas, those urban clusters under 50,000 in population, but are critically important to the regions that they serve. We've talked about transit-oriented development. That's one of those $25 words that simply means it's the mix of use around a transportation or a transit stop. Could be a train station, in my case, could be a transit stop, or a BRT stop, in your case. But it's, it's housing, it's commercial, it's retail, it's educational opportunities, all within a walkable area. Um, why is it important to us? Well, it's a matter of choice. We want people to be able to choose where they live, where they work, and how they get there. And, and uh, TOD allows you to do that. It certainly creates more flexibility. Well, that's what young people are looking for. And that's what the baby boom population, the largest population ever in the history of this country, that has expected to have the longest life expectancy of any generation in the history of this country. It's a convergence of the creative young people and us retiring baby boomers all looking for very similar things. And of course, it, it has a significant impact on your climate. Meridian was the first city in Mississippi to go green. I was a Republican mayor for 16 years. Um, didn't set it on the environment. The climate looks pretty good in Meridian. But it's a matter of how you spend your money. You can spend your money heating and cooling buildings and treating water and sewer in the old fashioned ways or you can do it differently and have more money to hire policemen and buy fire trucks. It's your choice. Um, in any plan, we're talking about implementing plans, partnerships are essential. And, and I mentioned to the mayors this morning, you know, you're going to have a partnership. Now, you either do it up front with the public or you're going to do it at the end when they all show up at a council meeting. So the partnerships are critical from the beginning and be and listen when you engage in those partnerships. If you don't have a hero, and sometimes you don't, you the community may have to create the hero. Someone who's willing to die in the ditch uh, over uh, what they believe in the importance for the future of your community. And then of course, when you have a plan, act on it. Uh, the public, I believe, is very uh, disappointed at the fact that government doesn't move in a more expeditious way. And of course, as a Partnerships are a puzzle, but they all link together to give you a vibrant community. Well, I'm going to tell a little more personal story. Chris asked about the reasons that we should engage in all of this, and for me, the reason was simple. It's a way to breathe life and back into the hometown that I loved, and that's the hometown of Meridian, Mississippi. Um, we built the South's first multimodal transportation center in Meridian. Uh, it was the first of its kind for a city of our size in the United States, and it was an economic development effort as far as I was concerned. I would like to believe that you all know about my hometown of Meridian, but for the few of you who do not, uh, I'll tell you Meridian is a city of 40,000 people. We're located on the Mississippi-Alabama border, but we're the retail, medical, employment, educational, entertainment trade draw for 350,000 people that live in 11 rural counties in Mississippi and Alabama around us. If Meridian disappears tonight, 
350,000 people will either have to recreate her or move. Uh, we're served by two interstate highways, 20 and 59, that connect you from Dallas to Atlanta to New Orleans. We're served by the longest runway in two states. We can land anything in Meridian. We have reasonably good air service um, from Meridian to Atlanta Hartsfield. Everything that moves through the air from Meridian must go to Atlanta Hartsfield first. Uh, I told young people last night, I'm convinced that when breath leaves my body, my spirit first goes to Atlanta Hartsfield. And then it will be reassigned to one of two other destinations. Uh, we're also on the Amtrak Crescent Line, which I like to believe originates in Meridian and heads south to New Orleans and originates in Meridian and heads north to New York. But that tells you where we are, but it doesn't tell you why we are. And I think when you look at your hometown, and I urge you to do this here in Eugene, um, why did you come about as a city? What are your strengths? Why did a city emerge here? then a real assessment of who are you now and be unvarnished when you look at, at your assessment of who you are. And then the third question is the most important. Well, Meridian was first established as villages for the Choctaw Indians. Um, and they 30 miles from Meridian, they now have a very upscale casino. But as a city, Meridian came about in 1850 when two railroads crossed there and needed a city to emerge. You see, it was transportation infrastructure and an important geographic location in the southeast that caused Meridian to come about. So we grew as a railhead in Mississippi, a very important railhead in Mississippi, until the spring of 1864. And that same railroad structure, infrastructure, drew General William Tecumseh Sherman to Meridian, who brought his own peculiar brand of urban renewal <laughs> to Meridian. He burned every structure in Meridian to the ground, heated the rail, tied them around trees to create what was known as Sherman's bow ties. That's what was left of the once great Union Station in Meridian, just the baggage wing. Doesn't say much about our community, does it? Tells us we've turned our back on our visitors, we've turned our back on our past, our heritage, the very strengths it made us. And worse, we've turned our back on our future. But the most important question you have to ask yourself here in this region and in this city is, who do you aspire to be? Who do you look at your children and grandchildren and tell that you want to be for the future? Well, this was the 1907 Union Station in Meridian, Mississippi. That structure says something about who the people believed they were then and the importance they would hold in that region for the next hundred years. I hope our station says something similar to our grandchildren and great-grandchildren. You know, you have to have a vision that can inspire a community, and you have to show people. Um, most people can't see something that doesn't exist, so you do it with visuals. Uh, we actually do have a beacon that shines out of the top of Union Station you see in this first picture. And if you show the public a visual, you better build it so that it looks like that visual. You know, they may not remember much, but they will remember every detail of that visual that you show them. Uh, but it inspires them. You know, Meridian had lost its self-confidence. And a community has a personality just like a human being does. And I can sense it when I come into a community. If you speak ill of your hometown, then it's going to reflect out to those who come to visit. And we won't want to come back. Well, in Meridian, that was the case. Um, young people would say, I can't wait to get out of Meridian. Uh, we had no self-confidence. Um, why would you ever come to Meridian? We had economic development would ask developers, why would you invest in Meridian? Um, we had paid no attention to infrastructure, no creative financing. We didn't have partnerships between the mayor and the council, much less the city and the county government, and our idea of design was to build disposable buildings to show that we were good stewards of the public purse. We built these ugly, atrocious buildings in the 40s and 50s that said nothing inspirational or aspirational of about the people of our community. Well, we knew we had to have partnerships to build such a facility. 
Um, one was Mississippi Department of Transportation. It was those transportation enhancement funds that we used to help fund Union Station. We also needed our strong congressional delegation. I needed a champion at the federal level, so I took my senator on board the Amtrak Crescent train, and um, we walked through the train, and he got to speak to the single parents with children headed to visit their grandmother, and the only way they could afford to get there, because they didn't have a personal automobile, but was by rail. He visited with the senior citizen couples that were on board, worked hard all of their lives, now they wanted to take time to see this great, wonderful land, didn't want to be beaten to death on the interstate highways, so they chose rail. He talked to the disabled veterans on board. The only respectable way they could travel comfortably was by passenger rail. And then on the last car were the children of the Special Olympics from all over the state of Mississippi that had come together in Meridian to board the train to ride to Washington to compete in the National Special Olympic Games in the capital of their country. And the only, they all have special needs, and the only way they could get there was on this car that Amtrak had been kind enough to equip um, for their travel. And the senator got to visit with them, and then at the end of the car, I turned around, and I said, now, Senator, do we walk back through and tell these people this great nation can't afford this transportation choice and option for them? I had my hero. Um, we knew we needed inner city bus would be an integral part, uh, city transit system, certainly Amtrak would be one of our major modes, but what we didn't realize is what it would do to affordable housing. Um, we were the first multimodal center, we were the last Hope 6 project approved in this country. And what it would do to the restoration of the other buildings within our downtown, we have the largest mix of turn of the century uh, historic architecture uh, in Mississippi, one of the largest in the South. We had failed to recognize that. And then the entertainment and educational options that would spring up because of this initial investment. Um, I won't take you through the funding. The city had a million three, basically, in this project. We leveraged ICE-T money, uh, Intermodal Service Transportation Efficiency Act money, um, as well as prepaid leases and other things. You're seeing some pictures of the inside of the of the structure. You've got to be very sensitive to the history uh, as you uh, build and design. This is the rear of, of Union Station facing track side, which looks better than most stations facing street side. Um, between New Orleans and New York, save for the 30th Street Station in, in Philadelphia and Union Station in DC, this is the nicest station on the line. Uh, if you've been into New York, uh, you know, it was said at one time a man arrived in New York by train like a king, now he scurries in like a rat. Well, if you've been to, on the train into New York, you know that's so. Um, quality design is critical. If you're going to build it, build it to make a statement. Build it to last. Build it to say something about who you are and who your grandchildren will be in that process. Um, I'm an optimistic person. I thought this would be a big success. It's now the most heavily used public, project, uh, public space in Meridian. 250 events held there. 300,000 people a year use Union Station. City of 40,000. 300,000 people coming into your downtown. That creates opportunity for retail, opportunity for dining, opportunity for residential growth. Um, and uh, it's been embraced for public events and, events and private events as well. What really surprised me, though, was the economic impact. Meridian put a million three in it. It has leveraged $135 million of additional public-private investment within three blocks of that facility. That's a 100 to 1 return on investment. It's not a bad deal for the city. Um, across the street from Union Station is a terminal hotel. It's now office complexes there. Um, the first floor has the still rather unfortunately named Terminal Cafe uh, in the bottom. Uh, but specialty retail is popping up again in the downtown and condominiums in the downtown. When I started this project, me and my two children were the only people who lived in the downtown. Now we see market rate apartments and upscale condominiums. Again, 40, com community of 40,000. First floor is commercial, second floor is eight. Uh, condominiums at 250000 apiece, top four 
floor is four condominiums, 500,000 apiece, unfinished space. Um, remarkable turn, and it's inspired other uh, restorations. This is our 1915 Beaux-Arts City Hall that has, we left the, the project's bid and underway. It is not just now reopened. Archives and History of Mississippi call it the single most important historic restoration in Mississippi of this decade, and it even carried over to things such as fire departments. But it also brought about the Riley Center for Performing Arts and Educational Conference Center. You see this building facing us is the old Marx Rothenberg Hotel, um, I mean, Marx Rothenberg Department Store. It is now a conference center for Mississippi State University, and next to it is the Grand Opera House of Mississippi, which was built in um, 1889, and it was designed by the firm that designed the original Metropolitan Grand Opera House in New York, which was demolished, also designed the National Theater in Washington. This is what she looks like today. That is a picture from center stage at the Riley Center, double horseshoe balcony. We uh, found 30 different original fabrics, wall coverings there. We lovingly uh, replicated all of those. Original paint finishes return. It's an absolutely breathtaking, splendid facility with side boxes. No seat is more than 80 feet from center stage. This is an evening's performance where you may go from September to May and see Wynton Marsalis and the Kennedy Center Orchestra. You might see Hal Holbrook perform Mark Twain Tonight or the Soweto Gospel Choir perform or the Queen's Own Savoyards from London come with their own orchestra to perform the Mikado uh, in this space. But that kind of energy and artistic energy in the downtown is transformational for your people and draws the entire region in. And there she is in the evening. Um, this was public housing in Meridian. I wouldn't want to live there, would you? Crime high. So we worked for 11 years with our congressional delegation to replace it with Hope Six. Notice the sidewalks, the landscaping, the lighting, we created neighborhood again, and it fits into the architectural fabric of that historic neighborhood. Crime is gone, vanished. Um, people who live in public housing, at least in the South, that lived in that housing will say, well, I stay at Victory Village. Walk down the street with me, and it looks just as clean and nice today as it did in this opening shot. And the neighbors will come out and say, I live at such and such an address. And my friends, the difference between staying and living is ownership. It's ownership in not so much that house, but that block. And it's ownership in the future of that neighborhood. And it's ownership in the future of that city. You believe you matter all of a sudden. And we could put you in a three-bedroom, two-and-a-half-bath home. If you were the working poor for $70,000, we'd give you, the city would, a $10,000 down payment assistance. We'd take you to the bank, work you through that torturous process to get your loan. If you volunteered in a designated not-for-profit, we'd forgive your loan, $2,000 a year for five years. Now you're in a home at $60,000. And these were families who had never in the history of their family owned a home before. It's transformational. Um, of course, public transit, though, is what connects it. And for us, it might be the small bus. It might be the trolley that works the downtown. It's our uh, uh, disabled um, vehicles, uh, accessible vehicles that work the community and connect us out to the Naval Air Station where we train 60% of them strike pilots for the U.S. Navy, but it's also simple things like how children get to school. This is young children walking down the street because there are no sidewalks to get to school. Well, you wouldn't want to send your children down the street like that to get to school, so we solved it with sidewalks and crosswalks and created safe ways for children to live in neighborhoods and go to neighborhood schools. Um, it's also about activity. Mississippi has the highest um, per capita obesity rate, only exceeded by West Virginia. Um, we 
USA Today did a study that Americans have the highest obesity rate of any people in the world. They followed up that Mississippi had, at that time, the highest obesity rate of any state in the Union, which to, and I was a very fat child, which convinced me we were the fattest folks on the planet. So I put the people on a diet, and we worked with, I, I challenged them to lose 10,000 pounds. I told the young people last night, I knew 50 people who could take care of the 50,000 pounds all by themselves. <laughs> but we worked with Blue Cross Blue Shield to create exercise stations along jogging paths, to add those paths. Um, walking paths out at uh, 3,500 acres of city-owned property, the lar 15th largest urban forest in the country, right next to the downtown city center. And those folks lost 9,500 pounds. Um, but it's children, too. Uh, our children have an obesity problem, and this is exercise equipment at public housing. And it looks like a playground to kids, but all of it was picked to see that they got exercise, climbing, jumping, moving, um, and it's really made a difference. Uh, you see uh, Union Station and, it, and how it's being enjoyed and used by the public, and I'll tell you this, it wasn't always popular. I was sued twice over this project. It was used against me in three campaigns. Uh, now you can't find the people who were opposed to it. The man who filed the lawsuits, who lost those lawsuits, who had to pay our legal fees at the end of the day, came to me after Union Station opened and wanted to rent office space. He's sitting in my office across from me and I backed my chair up and he said, Mayor, what are you doing? And I said, well, the Lord's getting ready to open that ceiling and strike you. Um, you know, I can't believe you want office space, but it, but it was already leased out. He ultimately became a good friend and decided he had been chasing these phantoms all his life and that actually we were doing what we said we were doing. Uh, but to engage in a work like this, you really have to have a focus that's beyond two years or four years. You've got to be focused on a point of time out there in the future, 20 years from now. That's what my forefathers did in Meridian in a remarkable way. Well, you know, it's hard to focus, especially if you're elected beyond your term. It's hard to focus 20 years out. It's especially hard to focus for a time where you will no longer even be here. And to find that focus for me, I, for a point in the future where I wouldn't exist, yet I cared very strongly about what happened at that point, I find it reflected in the eyes of my now six-year-old grandson, Ethan, and his brand new little brother, Hayden, that you see him holding in his arms. And I think to capture that sense of connectivity one generation to the next and how anyone in leadership from the private sector or the public sector must hand that baton off at some point to someone else, I think that kind of uh, focus and vision is best captured by the words of the poet Vachel Lindsay, writing about his hometown of Springfield, Illinois. Record it for the grandson of your son. A city is not built in a day. Our little town cannot complete her soul till countless generations pass away. We must have Lincoln-hearted men, for a city is not built in a day. And they must come and go and do their work while countless generations pass away. I urge you, for your hometown, for the grandsons of your sons, be Lincoln-hearted in your commitment to the place you love, your hometown. Thank you.